Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. We've been in the section of Romans on our sanctification. That's Romans chapters 6 through 8 is all of the area that's going to cover that. And we've been in chapter 6. And having come through those first five chapters, we know that we are justified unto eternal life and there is nothing that can ever be done to change that. Now, thank God for that. But if all God ever did was justify you unto eternal life, if that's all he ever did, then you would know he doesn't care how you live day by day. You understand that statement? But, it, but that's not all he did. He didn't just justify, he didn't just save us and, and give us eternal life and then leave us alone. But in Romans 6... You turn from justification to sanctification and you now get faced with the fact that you have been given more than, I like this little acronym, justification unto eternal life. You're given more than that. You are given sanctification unto functional life. Now I'd kind of like for you to get that thing in your head a little bit so that you'll 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 know that J U E L you know justification to eternal life S U F L sanctification unto functional life the difference between those is of course one of these is your eternal life out there in the heavenly places your functional life is the way you're living now day by day Live, we, the old terminology we would use would be living for God or living a spiritual life or, you know, that, that, that kind of, or the crucified life and all that kind of terminology that we're used to hearing. He provided a sanctification because it does matter to him how we live every day. In our justification, we were baptized, I'm just going to do it like this, baptized into Jesus Christ. And as we are baptized into Jesus Christ, we got, because a baptism is, somebody give me the short definition here. Baptism is a new identification. And because we got baptized into Jesus Christ, we got identified with Him. And because it's in that word likeness, like and likeness, which tells you what? It's an exact match. And that means when we got eternal life, let's just do it like this. When we got eternal life, we didn't just get eternal life, we got His eternal life. When we got righteousness, just do it like that, we didn't just get righteousness, we got His righteousness imputed to us. When we got atonement or at one -ment as we went through that, we didn't just get that, we got His at one -ment. How at one is He with the Father? Whoa, it just doesn't get any better than that. That's what we got, His at one -ment. All of that came out of our justification. Now, when you come to sanctification, not talking about eternal life issues now. Now we're talking about, we're talking about now you get baptized into his death. So before, in your justification, you were baptized into him. Now, as a further identification of that, we, we find we're not just baptized into Jesus Christ. We are also baptized into his death. And we discovered that that death was shorthand for really the whole process of redemption, which includes what? Death, burial, and resurrection. We are identified with every part of that. So there were things that were accomplished in the death of Jesus Christ, specifically that he did, that you and I are identified with, and we had to have that. Not only that, but when he was put into the tomb, that wasn't a side issue at all. In fact, that's a major issue, that his being put into the tomb he was doing something in those three days and three nights very specific. And our identification with that burial gave us something. 
that we had to have in our sanctified life in order to have functional life. And in His resurrection, we're identified with that so that we can walk in newness of life. We've talked about some of these things uh, all along. Now, the thing I want to tell you is this, this being baptized into his death, which includes, that's the term the Bible uses to encompass what happened on the cross, in the tomb, and in his resurrection. When it says we're baptized into his death, all of those things were for the, the purpose of us now being able to accomplish something in these bodies that we were not able to accomplish before. And I'm going to show you what, I'm just going to put this on the board. We haven't read the verse yet. It's in, it's here in Romans 6 and we're coming up on it here pretty soon. But we are supposed to produce something. We're supposed to produce fruit. I don't know why I did that. Unto my marker is getting lighter and lighter. We're supposed to produce fruit unto holiness. Unto holiness. Now, that tells you right off the bat, knowing that, that tells you that that's part of your sanctification. And do you know why? Because the definition, remember, there was two parts to sanctification. And holiness is one of those parts by definition of the term. So you know when you're talking about holiness, you're talking about your sanctification. And he said you're going to produce in your functional life, in other words, your everyday life, in your Christian life, you're going to produce now, now because of your sanctification, you for the very first time, <laughs> you have the ability to produce fruit unto holiness. That is something your Heavenly Father looks at and says, I like that. Now, there's something that's being provoked right here. Do you, I'll tell you what the Scripture's doing here. You ever, you ever in school and the school bully did this to you? You didn't like that. Well, you, you were the school bully and you did it. Okay, can you just recall? Okay. The thing is, when that was provoking. That's what that was. That was provoking. Or someone got up in your space. That was provoking. These scriptures are provoking something in your flesh. They're actually poking it in the chest. Because what it's going to tell you, what you're going to learn, is that you cannot, before you trust Jesus Christ to be your Savior, you cannot produce anything with regard to your functional life. Nothing. Before you're saved, you cannot produce functional life. You know the only thing you, you, that you can produce is death. That's the way the Bible... It's, it's, not, it's not fruit unto holiness, it's fruit unto ungodliness. That's what it is. And do you know now why it's poking you? Because right now there's something in your mind that goes, no, listen... I know I couldn't produce my own sanctification, but look, I avoided, I didn't do a lot of things I could have done, so see, I did do pretty good. But, you, but you, here's the thing, even when, but when you're unsaved, even when you're trying to do something righteous to God, it's a putrefying stench. In your mind, in my mind, we were doing the best we could, and we could have been worse. But, and so it looks like we were doing okay. But God looks at that and says, because of your identity in Adam, because of your sin nature, because you're a slave to sin, even the good things that you, you term good things, I term good things that we did before we got saved, God says those are the production of death. You say, well, how can that be? It's the sa I did the same th I do the same thing saved, it's life, I do it then, it's death. How is that? Because the source is different. Where it comes from is different. I got to stay comes out of the comes out of the oven I set it down in front of you and you're going man that looks good I get another steak comes out of the dumpster does it make a difference to you where it comes from 
still steak. Makes a difference. That's a bad illustration. But, you know, if you get it, if you get it, that's all I'm after. So, what I'm trying to say to you here is that, now we're going to work off of this for a minute because here's what I'm going to do in this first session. The whole thing about your sanctification as you get into Romans 6, and you have seen this, is that you are, this is the primary thing that you are faced with, that you are dead to sin. And we have spent a lot of time talking about that, I realize. So now what I'm going to do is, I hope I'm just gauging this right, I'm going to show you five steps that you're being taken through that you, you need to go through all five steps. Is that right? One, two, three, four. Yeah. All five steps because these, these five steps produce the absolute assurance that you are dead to sin. And these steps are outlined right in the scripture, and so I want to give them to you. And, and, and that's kind of where we're going to focus this first session. Now there's some scripture that I want us to look at in this. Because one of the things that you know is when you were back here, before you were saved, when we say dead to sin, that sounds something almost close to what before we were saved, what were we? Before we were saved, we were dead in sin. Do you remember that? We're dead in trespasses and sin. Isn't it funny how just a little two-letter word change makes all the difference in the world? You're dead in sin, that means you're not saved. When you're dead to sin, that means you are saved, and that's your sanctified position. Now with that little bit of a change there, let me just tell you that we know what this one is. We know what being dead in sin is. And when we talk about being dead to sin, I hope that you that's, that's beginning to click in your thinking as well because that justification, justification solved this problem, dead in sin. I can tell that's going to be a problem, isn't it? So I'm going to get rid of this guy. Justification took care of being dead in sin. It's your sanctification that makes you dead to sin because now what it's going to do is it's going to give you the power to keep sin from reigning in your mortal body. That's what your sanctification is going to produce. Now let's take a look at the verses. Romans chapter 6 verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So when we got saved, we understand we got those three things. We got forgiveness of sins, we got imputed righteousness, we got an eternal life, we got permanent at one month with the Father, but when we were baptized into Jesus Christ, at the same time, we were also baptized into a further aspect, and that was all of his redemptive work. Now, we talked about that in his death, burial, and resurrection, and that means that all the victory that he got in his death, burial, and resurrection, specific things he was trying to do you become the beneficiary of. Now, because you wouldn't automatically know that, the scripture is going to come along and tell you what those things are so that you will know. That first thing it tells you is that you have been made dead to sin. Now take a look at Romans. You know, I shouldn't have done this one. Let me back up and give you three. Because three is really the one I want us to focus on. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So the very first step, the very first step that you're going to encounter is, is that by baptism you are identified 
with all that Christ did in his redemption. Everything that he did as the Redeemer in his death, burial, and resurrection, you get identified with every part of that. Now, I know if you went into most churches and made that statement, that wouldn't mean much because there has to be some, something that goes along with that to cause you to think about that the way that you're supposed to. That became a reality, though, for you because you know what baptism is. It's a new identification. That replaced an old identification, right? Who was the old identification with? Adam. Who's the new one with? Okay, so you've got that. And now you know that not only are you identified with him and you got all this good stuff, but you're also identified with him in his death, in his burial, and in the likeness of his resurrection. I mean, all that's spelled out for you. So you know all of that. But the thing that you need to know is, what did I get because I was identified with that? What did I, what actually, because the whole thing is pointing, this whole thing is pointing to causing you to be able to say, not just say it, Anybody can say it. You know the old joke about the kid that said, I'm, I don't think I want to go to college. And the parents say, well, sure, you've got to go. And he goes, why? And they say, because if you don't, you can't say you're a college graduate. And he goes, sure, I can. I'm a kaga giga. I'm a oh, my goodness, I can't say it. It was a joke. <laughs> You could say it, but what he's trying to do is, what your father's trying to do is produce an absolute understanding and assurance that you are dead to sin by you seeing it the way he sees it. And you understand it the way he understands it, so it becomes a reality for you the way he intends for it to. Not to be just words on the whiteboard or words on the Bible page, but that it really is that for you. And so there's five, and so here's the five steps that's going to take you through that. And this first one is in verse three. That's the verse we just read. That you are totally identified with him in all that he did. Here's the next one. And in verse 4, now I'm going to flip uh, PowerPoint slides. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness, the exact match, of his resurrection. Now, when he talks about this, that second step is that I am... I'm planted in the likeness of his death, burial, resurrection. Can we just do it like that? Planted in the likeness. It, the Bible just says, I'm planted in the likeness of his death. It was that shorthand that talked about all of those. Now, because it does matter to your Heavenly Father how you conduct yourself every day once that you're saved, you should have anticipated that He was going to do something that would make that kind of life possible. What is it? Uh, let me see, I'm going to take you to a verse. I just, I, here's what I need to do. I was looking at this, and the reason I'm kind of going back and forth and looking at my notes is because I was either just going to give you this or I was going to kind of probe you a little bit to see where you are. So I really need to understand where we are. So let me ask the question this way. There are two major areas that you know if you're going to live for your Heavenly Father every day, there are two major areas that have to be solved. They're huge. Now, if I'm asking the question right, that will prompt an answer in your thinking. Does anybody want to take a stab at this? Maybe I'm not, the terminology of the question isn't as precise as it needs to be. But there, to, what is it, what's the two things that you know are going to have to be fixed 
before you're actually going to be able to live that functional life unto God, to produce fruit unto holiness, to really live the way he wants you to live. What are those two what 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 are those two huge problems that you know your father is going to have to fix? Okay, now Teresa is saying you're thinking. That's that's really that's a good answer. That's a that's a good answer. It's really close, really close to what I'm getting at. It's a part of it. It's not a wrong answer at all. Let's in fact we'll go with that for for a moment. What's the other thing? Okay, okay, a full knowledge and understanding, and that kind of goes with what Teresa said. Let, let's just talk about that one for a minute. What would we call that? Yeah, you call that your mind. Let's, okay, you, he, you, he, has to, he has to change the way we think, and that's true. <laughs> okay, now, now you're actually going to go in a little different direction because you've hit a key here. I'm really glad, I'm glad we did it this way. Now, for the folks watching on the DVD, I'm always mad when I don't say it. Linda said the soul. All right, now, or, okay, and now Doc says the spirit. You've, you've, you've hit this with terminology, but there's two, here's the two big things. Let me, do, let me give it to you in my terms so that you will understand how all these fit in to the answer. He's going to have to fix something in your inner man. Right? What's the other word for that? If he's going to have to, in fact, here, I got it. I'll, I'll put it up on the board. He's going to have to do something about your inner man or your heart. That's got to be fixed. Let, let me ask you, does the guy that's saved always want to live like he's saved? That's got to be fixed, right? There has to be, look, if he just forgives your sins and he doesn't do anything else for you, does that fix your heart? No, and I'm pointing here, but I'm just saying, it, no, it doesn't. But there's something else now. Now, that's the inner man thing. And when Linda says the soul and Doc says the spirit, we're, that's inner man stuff, okay? So those are, those are not wrong answers. Now, Teresa said you're thinking. Someone said the mind. All right, now, what is your mind? <laughs> Doc said is isn't any good. Okay, okay, your brain? Your brain, what is that? It's part of something. Oh, it's connected to that, but it's not. It's connected to that, but it, it's part of something else. It's part of your body, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, all of it, that's right. Because the second part, PowerPoint, God is going to have to do something about your body. I know you're looking in the mirror every day going, please, do something. That that's not what I'm talking about. I, because, because, see, you should have already been tipped off to this because you already know that once you're saved, sin lives where? In your body. That's right, in the flesh. Now, I'm going to explain something to you right here. I just need to talk to you for a minute. Sin is in every cell of your body. It is. But everything that you do in this body, think about all your senses. You see, you touch, you feel, you smell, you know, all, all of the, everything, you're, okay, I'm looking at you. My eye, z, sorry, <laughs> I just have one eye. My eyes see an image. But that image doesn't mean a thing to me unless what? Well, okay, and how do you know? How do you know what it is? Yeah, your brain has to process that, right? So I look at Wanda and I go, Wanda's wearing purple. I see the image, but that image doesn't mean a thing to me until my brain processes that image. Well, now before, okay, now stick with me here. Before you get saved... It's as though, it's as though you're looking through sin-tinted glasses. 
I can't even see y'all now. <laughs> These are for up close. <laughs> I see men as trees walking. I mean, I... Before you get saved, you, your, your eye sees it, but your brain processes everything because who's the boss before you get saved? All right, Satan is, but there's something ruling in you. Sin. Sin sits on the throne. Remember, sin reigned unto death. Remember Romans 5. So the, the, every, that's, and that's where when you see that image, that's where lust and desire and sinfulness and all that other stuff, you know where that comes from? The process. Your eye sees an image and your brain processes it through that filter of sin. And when you and that's why everything goes through that. Now because of that, now remember we talked about before, but when you get saved, remember I told this to you last time, you didn't get a memory wipe. You still you still remember all of the thoughts you had before. You remember those things. They're still there. They're still in the memory bank. Because the brain is, the, and, and I look, I'm not getting off track here, because the Bible has a lot to say about your mind, renewing your mind and all that kind of bit. And, and when we get to Romans 8, and he tells you to walk in the Spirit, he's going to tell you to mind the things of the Spirit. And that's a process by the way, that by which you're going to refine what we're doing right now. What we're doing right now to learn to live the sanctified life in Romans 6. Look, can I just break it right here and tell you, look, here's the, here's the way this goes. In Romans chapter 6, you know we're getting through these first 13 verses that tell you how to live this sanctified life. And that's true. But as soon as you get to verse 13, starting in verse 14 and continuing on through chapter 7, I think it goes 25 verses, all the way through from 614 to 725 because this 13 verses poked you in the chest and provoked your flesh the natural tendency is going to be for you on it to be di different levels for everybody but the natural tendency once you get this down is to try to live your sanctified life according to the law in some way. You may not call it the law. It may be your own little set of rules that you need to live by. Or it may be some preacher's list of do's and don'ts. Or it may be the Mosaic law in the Bible. But there is going to be a natural tendency for you to try to live your sanctified life by going back to the law in some way. And so it's like at verse 13, your father breaks off this because he knows that. He breaks off this instruction to tell you how to live this sanctified life every day and he corrects that wrong thinking and then when you get to chapter 8 the first 13 verses are going to I don't want to say they go back to this, but they take that subject back up. It's almost like he was talking about something and then he stops and he says, don't think of it this way. And once he corrects that, he comes back to where he left off and he continues on. And that's what you're going to get in these first 13 verses in chapter 8. Now the reason I'm saying it to you is because the problem in your body, you would think, oh, so it's just all in my head. Well, it is in your head. But the problem is there is sin in every cell. And you know what? This body isn't redeemed. There's nothing about this body that's redeemed. But where's the central processing unit that runs the body? Right up here. And because it does, do you know what these things do? These, you know what the Bible calls your arms, your legs, your feet? Your, you know what it calls it? Members. Is that what you said? Members. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going down. Okay. Members of your members of your body. But there's something that controls those members. Do you know what is it when you look and you 
and you, 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 you know, what's going on in your mind you know isn't right. You know where that, you know where that is. That's not your hand. That's this. But when you carry that action out, look, I can remember when I was, I'll just give you an illustration out of my own life. When I was a kid, I saw another kid that had one of those little cars and you, it, 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 you, it, you put it together, it all snapped together, and it had a little bumper on the front with a spring on it. And when you rolled that into something and it hit that spring, the whole car flew apart. It was just a little crash car. And then you just snap it all back together and roll it again. I thought that was the neatest thing in the world. Now, I was a really straight-laced kid. And I thought, man, that is the neatest thing I've ever seen. Well, my buddy, two doors down, not trying to put the blame off, it was me. My buddy, two doors down, said, you know what? They have those at TGNY. I said, wow, I wonder how much they are. He said, we can get one. And I said, well, I don't have any money. He said, yeah, but we can get one. And I thought, oh, man, that scared me to death, you know. But I wanted that car. So we went up to TGNY, and he educated me all the way up there. Here's how you do it. Because I was naive about that. And so we got up there, and, you know, he wa- to me, he was terrible. I thought, you'll get caught. Well, I snuck it, put it in my pocket, I walked out, I got home, I got, you know, I made a little ramp in the backyard, I I took it out of the box, I put it together, and I rolled it down that ramp, and it hit that brick at the end and flew apart, and it wasn't fun anymore. I was eaten up with guilt. So I put that car back together, I put it back in the package, I carried it back to TGNY, and I snuck it back onto the shelf. And I never thought about that car anymore after that. That completely, you know what I learned that day? That ruined that for me. Absolutely ruined that. Okay, now I've gotten over that kind of thinking in my, okay, no, not. <laughs> it did, it just totally ruined it for me. And I thought, how could you even enjoy that? Why was I telling you that? Because you're tempted to steal cars at TGNY. I, I, it's, I'm just giving you a practical lesson. Yeah, yeah, it was in my head, right. And that meant, you know, my body went and carried it out. And you know what? That was fruit unto death. That's what that was. Now, that one's easy to see because it was stealing. What's hard for us to see is even when we go do good stuff as a person who's under the dominion and rulership of sin, that's still death. (laughs) No, what What made that life is when I trust... Well, you know what, though? I was already saved when I did that. I got saved when I was eight. And I think I was eight or nine when I did that. So you know what? Putting it back was the right thing to do. Okay, so you know what? That was life. I guess what I should have done is gone to the store manager and said, I took it, now I'm bringing it back. But I was scared of that too. I don't know, you know. So, I mean, you know, hey, I don't know. It's my first crime. I have no, you know, I didn't know how you do that. Okay? Life of crime. I can see now, son, you're headed for the big house. Okay. There is something, though, that we get that we're identified with, I'm just bringing us back now, in his death, burial, and resurrection that's necessary for our sanctified life. Because even though, I'm getting way off track of these notes, let's do it like this. Let's use this word planted, because that's the Bible word. Let me back up. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. That word planted conjures up what kind of image to you? What do you think of when you think of planted? All right, something put into the ground that's going to come up and produce fruit, right? And because we're identifying with his death, Let's go back to the book of John and look what Jesus said about his death. 
I know we're going to the book of John, but you understand we're not going to get Israel doctrine. We're going to look at a statement Jesus made about his death because you're planted in the likeness of his death. Yes? Okay, so with that in mind, here it is. John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Isn't that, that's a true principle, isn't it? With regard to his death, did that happen? It sure did. There was something that could only be produced, a fruit that could only be brought forth because he did die. And by the way, planted, put into the ground. And then it's going to produce, guess what? A new, out of that death, it's going to come a newness of life. Now, I'm just showing you an analogy that that's what's going to be happening to us. That we are going to be planted in the likeness of his death. And we're also going to be in the likeness of his resurrection. So the benefit that's coming up for us is very important. Okay, step three. Step three. My old man is crucified. That's the third thing, the third step that your father takes to prove to you that you are dead to sin and what all that means. My old man is crucified. And I'm going to take you to Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. Now we covered this verse in our last session. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That old man was enslaved to sin. That's, that's the... Now, if I talk about... Let, let's do a, a little bit of defining here. If I'm talking about the old man... What am I talking about? Okay, okay, the sin, the sin nature. I'm looking for a different word. All, all that's, that's not wrong. Yeah, when you're, when you're talking about your old man, you're talking about your old identification. That identification in Adam. That got crucified. That's the way in which you are dead with Christ. The old stuff got killed off. By the way, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and what? Die. So he says, the first thing I'm doing in order to make you dead to sin is I am killing your old man off. That old identity is what was the slave to sin. All right, now, I have a couple things to put on the board here. We're going to come back to the brain for a minute. If you just know what went on in my brain, it would scare you. Because as soon as I say this, that little song out of the Wizard of Oz, if I only had a brain, you know, comes into my head. Our old, our old identity, let's do this. Because I, I, I have enough time to do this and then we'll come back. The old identity, we're talking about the old identity, ID. The old identity that we had in Adam before we were saved. That of condemnation. When we got our new ID identity, that was our justification. In our condemnation status, we were sinners, right? But when we came to Christ, what did he do? Because we were under sin, what did he do to solve that in our justification? What did he specifically do to solve the fact that we were sinners, that we were under sin? Oh, oh, okay, but it, for us, we would say he did what? Okay, okay, he forgave our sin, right? Okay, we are unrighteous. I'm pulling these words right out of Romans 1 through 5. What did he do in our justification to solve that? 
Okay, he imputed righteousness to us, right? We were enemies of God. What did he give us in justification to solve that? Okay, he gave us permanent atonement, at one moment with God, right? Now, that's, now, that's the, now that's the condemnation justification. When you come to your sanctification before, under your old identity in Adam, you were under abomination. That's the, way, that's the characterization of how you lived. Once you're in Christ, God replaces that identity. You're no longer identified as an abomination, but now as a sanctification. Okay? Now, let's see how far I want to take you to this. Under this, we were servants of sin. It was our master. What is the sanctified solution to that? Oh, okay, Doc says it. We're dead to sin. There's two more that go under this heading. We just haven't gotten to them yet. I've talked about one ahead of time a little bit because what you know is you're not only dead to sin, but you're what? Yeah, you're alive unto God. That's going to be the second fix under sanctification. Because we haven't read the verse yet, I'm not going to give it to you. But the thing I'm trying to establish with you here is that once he gives you newness of life, I th have I got a verse I'm giving you here? Once he gives you newness of life, the steps that we're outlining here are the very steps that say to you, I now understand what it means to my father for me to be dead to sin, and I'm absolutely persuaded beyond any shadow of a doubt that that is a true statement for me. I am no longer enslaved to sin. But why in the world would you ever be tempted that you still were? You already know the answer. What? You have sin in your members, and so how does it show up, though? How does that sin in your members show up? Yes, in your brain, because the, the same mind that was running things before is still, you know, but, but it's not telling you what to do now. You know what it's doing now? It's, it's tempting you. It's appealing to you, and it does it over and over and over and over and over and over. And because everything up here, so he says, I got to do something about the inner man, the heart. I got to do something about the body. I got to fix that. And the central place that runs the body is the brain. So here's what he does. He says that part, that part that was a servant to sin, that was a bond slave to sin, your old man. I put him to death. And that broke the connection between now what you are able to do in this body and what you used to do in this body. It's... Remember when Paul... I you know this is a bad illustration. Remember when they were in jail and... They were singing songs till midnight, and there was an earthquake. And do you remember what happened at the earthquake? All the doors came open, and all their, their fetters came off. And the jailer woke up, and he thought what? He thought they were all gone, and that was going to be his head. And Paul said, don't be alarmed, we're all still here. But let me ask you something. When those fetters fell off and those doors fell down, did he stay in that jail? Actually, you know what he did? He witnessed to that jailer, didn't he? And you know where they wound up going? To the guy's house where they heard the message, right? That's right. And all of his household was saved. You know what that's the equivalent of? That's the equivalent of now. Now that that's just that's the reason that's a bad illustration is because it doesn't really fit what we're talking about here. Because when you're a servant to sin, when those bars fall down and those shackles come off, you run out of that prison. 
actually, that's not a right way either. God destroys that prison. That the body of sin might be, what? Destroyed. He's destroying that prison. So, what he's talking about when he's talking about that you're dead to sin is he's talking about putting you in a position now as we work our way up the steps, putting you in a position to do something that you were never able to do before. But he has to explain every step of this process to you so that you really understand how free you are. Because if you sit there with the shackles off and the doors are open and you say, I'm just going to stay here of my own free will, what good does that do you? That's why I'm saying, you can't just say to sin, okay, I know that I used to be a servant and now I'm not, but I'm going to go back and do the things I used to do. You know what you're doing? You're just walking back into the prison cell and putting the shackles back on. And you're just volunteering to get back under its mastership again. But you're still, fr you're still free. It's just you volunteered to do that. Okay, now all of that is to set up something 